uh, urgency. We're all practicing lawyers. And what we try to do is create an arbitration bar, which over a period of time, hopefully will create an arbitration culture that uh, somewhat resembles what we see in different parts of the world. Uh, I think the government has made a start. Um, the Law Commission has recommended uh, big changes in the new Arbitration Amendment Bill. But having said that, this we inaugurated the Mumbai part of the Indian Arbitration Forum almost uh, one year ago when Justice Ajit Shah simply um, had just published his report. Uh, now we understand that on 26th August, the Cabinet has now approved this uh, arbitration amendment, and hopefully um, when Parliament starts functioning like a Parliament again, it might actually get passed, and we will start getting some results. I mean, two of the issues that have arisen in that which are eye-catching is, one of the recommendations is that all arbitration in India be concluded within one year, and with a possible extension of six months. Uh, which is all very um, healthy, and uh, we just want to see how that's going to work. Uh, presently, as you know, most of the arbitrations are run by retired judges, some of whom are absolutely first rate and um, work completely conscientiously, but the pace is still slow. And we're now hoping that, like international arbitration, the arbitrators start imposing time limits on how much the witness can be cross examined, and parties are forced to stick to time limits more and more written arguments and reduce the oral arguments to an absolute minimum. We also hope, like other places, the arbitrators will actually read the papers in advance so that um, we don't have to have prolonged arguments and repetition and repeating and reading of uh, Supreme Court judgments. Uh, that's been the bane, and that's why it's, it's taken so long for some of these arbitrations to get completed. We're also trying to create a panel of non-judge arbitrators, uh, people who are experienced, people who have integrity, people who are well-known in the field and have conducted a large number of arbitrations themselves, so to create a new climate. And we hope that, in the sense, will start uh, progressing arbitrations considerably faster. And like I said, with time limits imposed, and we hope that uh, having imposed time limits, the courts don't take an adverse view of that and say there wasn't sufficient hearing or some sort of breach of natural justice. We're hoping it doesn't come to that because there's no way you're going to complete arbitrations in one year without that. We also know the other problem with the arbitration in India is uh, the slow pace in courts. While the judges are more and more very pro-arbitration and giving fairly strong judgments in favor of upholding awards by and large, uh, the problem is it just takes so long to get a hearing. And then you have three rounds. You have one in either the high court or the district court one round in appeal, and then potentially the Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court is, is great because at least there's a barrier, so they have an admission time, the SLP, and we know how fast the SLPs are disposed of. We've all had our experiences with that, and, um, but at least there's a barrier so that the matter not prolonged for a long time. And we're hoping to see that more and more lawyers um, are able to take arbitration uh, the same way it's done on an international level, with the same intensity, with the same results. Because uh, frankly, that is a proper dispute forum because it's very difficult to get disputes decided in court because the courts are overburdened. They take a long time, they work very consciously, but are completely and totally overburdened. And unless we make arbitration effective, um, you know, we're not gonna progress very far. And the judicial aspect is probably the one aspect where India is not put at the pace of the other economic reforms. We've seen it, Time and time that um, you will have all of us who have had foreign clients say, look, we'll do anything. We're happy to do business in India, but we do not want to decide any disputes in India. How do we get out of it? So we're very proud to have with us Justice Nariman, who's probably given the most progressive judgment on arbitration in recent times, the Associated Builders, which comprehensively deals with the issue and gets great guidance for all the courts as to when awards can be set aside and to what extent they need to be probed, et cetera. We've already had Justice Lodal's decision on Lal Mal on foreign awards, where he, he takes a view that since the award process is complete, uh, the public policy uh, issues will be 
very, very, very limited. And um, we're hoping to see those judgments followed more and more in the high courts, the district courts, because even today, don't forget that the district courts are hearing the bulk of the challenges to awards as well as the foreign awards. Um, we all had our own experiences there. So we don't want to comment on it further, but we're just hoping with this new regime, both with the civil courts bill and the new arbitration amendment, um, we'll see progress in terms of speed. Um, so therefore, um, ladies and gentlemen, we request you to support the Indian Arbitration Forum, uh, become members, follow us on the website. Uh, all we're trying to do is instill efficient practices so that the arbitration process is not prolonged and dragged out forever. We also hopefully that as sooner or later we will present an alternative list of arbitrators where parties, uh, clients, courts can consider appointment instead of uh, the same retired judges who are completely overburdened and will simply not be able to finish the arbitrations in the manner laid down by the court. Uh, with this, I want to take two minutes to just tell you a little bit about Gary Bourne, who's um, the chairman of the SEAC court. I was a member of the SEAC court with him for several years, and I've known him very well over the past years. Gary, apart from being the head of his uh, law firm for the dispute practice, is an extremely able counsel, even busier arbitrator, and now as chairman of the CI court, and also as a prolific writer. One of these, one day when I would dinner, I asked him, I said, Gary, you have made so many hats. Where do you get time to write, uh, write these books? He said, you won't believe it. I only sleep three hours a day. I spend all night writing. So he's got a commendable career, and um, now as chairman of the CIAC, he's all over India promoting CIAC and doing a, a terrific job of it. Of course, Justin Nariman needs no introduction. We all know him at, at the bar and at the bench, and like I said, we're very proud of his recent judgments on arbitration, which have been real eye-openers for most of us. Uh, won't take with that, won't take more time now. We we'll now request Gary uh, Bond to address the audience. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Hiru, for that that very kind introduction. Thanks also to the India Arbitration Forum for having me here this evening, and perhaps most importantly of all, thank thank you, thank each of, of you for for coming here to to listen to me. Some of you, um, I have to thank particularly because I think you listened to me earlier today, and um, I'm sure, at least to some extent, you're tired of that, and I apologize for you know, having to hear me yet again. I think, though, I'm going to change the focus to some extent of my presentation and the nature of my comments. This afternoon, throughout the course of today at the SEAC annual conference, we had a distinctly practical focus on arbitration. We looked at how, under the SEAC arbitration rules, and you'll forgive me a small commercial break here, we conduct arbitrations efficiently, cost-effectively, practically, pragmatically. My comments today, for those of you who have already heard me this afternoon, are not pragmatic, they're not cost-efficient, they're not um, expeditious. Instead, I'm going to focus on theory, because this is a forum. And what I thought I would talk about is the right to arbitrate. And because that's a little esoteric, I will need to develop this right, this right to arbitrate over the course of, of my remarks in the next, I think, 20 minutes or so that, that I've been allotted. Now, we all know, Hiro mentioned, um, that arbitration, international arbitration in particular, has become a preferred means of dispute resolution. We can see evidence of that all around the world. We can look at the institutional caseloads at SEAC, for example. Our, our caseload has been going steadily up year on year. We can look at the, the caseloads of our competitors, the International Chamber of Commerce, the LCIA, what have you. All of their caseloads increase. Arbitral institutions, which two decades ago barely existed, ICSID, the International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes, and had a caseload of, of under one a year on average, one arbitration a year, now are recording in the, in the hefty double digits. 
And it's not just in the number of cases, but it's the size and quality of cases. One sees that the size of disputes increases from being small matters to being very large matters. The Yukos arbitration award against the Russian Federation, $50 billion just earlier this year, is a little bit out of the ordinary, but it gives us some sense of not just the number of cases, but the magnitude of the disputes that are being submitted to arbitration. At the same time, one sees not just ordinary commercial disputes, which was the historic bailiwick, if you will, of international arbitration, but instead a whole range of new types of disputes, sports arbitrations, investment arbitrations, commodities, insurance, a whole range of different sorts of disputes, including even now class action arbitrations, uh, and the like, which historically were, were matters for, for exclusively national courts. The, the commitment of commercial parties to resolving their disputes by international arbitration, by arbitration of any sort, is in part because of the benefits that the arbitral process promises, and hopefully in most cases, brings. Namely, an efficient, neutral, cost-effective, commercially sensitive, and above all else, perhaps in the international context, enforceable means of dispute resolution. Because of the New York Convention, the United Nations Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, with 156 contracting states party to that convention, both international arbitration agreements and international arbitral awards enjoy a sort of global currency. They are enforceable in all 156 contracting states around the world by virtue of the Global Constitutional Charter for International Arbitration, the New York Convention. And equally, arbitral awards, once they have been obtained, can be enforced. They're portable. They can be enforced around the world in all 156 contracting states. And it is because of that enforceability, that commitment of states around the world to the arbitral process, that arbitration, international arbitration in particular, has enjoyed such substantial popularity over recent decades, over recent years. That said, we can't lie on our laurels, and one must remain vigilant. One must remain vigilant in part because history always is cyclical. History is always cyclical, including with respect to judicial attitudes, to some extent even legislative attitudes towards international arbitration, towards arbitration. There has been a history of judicial hostility in many countries, and I'll speak a little bit about this in a moment, towards arbitration, often focused on the notion that arbitration is a sort of second-class justice. It's a kind of rough justice that doesn't really accord with the rule of law. It deprives, in particular, citizens of their rights, their individual rights of access to the courts, and it deprives the legal system of the legitimacy and the correctness of judgments decided by national courts. And that sort of hesitance, that sort of skepticism about the arbitral process is something that has been recurrent throughout history and that has led to criticisms, and what I'm going to read from now goes back a century and a half ago to the 1840s in the United States to one of the great American jurists, Joseph Story. What he had to say is something that is reflective not just of the 1800s, but even of 2012, 2014, 2015. It is a sentiment, an attitude towards arbitration which is recurrent and which demands, as I said previously, vigilance on the part of all of us in the arbitration forum, in the arbitration community. Because these sorts of critiques can't go unanswered. They must be responded to. They must be taken seriously. This critique was as follows. Joseph's story said as follows. Now, we all know that arbitration at the common law, arbitrators at the common law, possess no authority whatsoever, even to administer an oath or to compel the attendance of witnesses. They cannot compel the production of documents and papers and books of account or insist upon a discovery of facts from the parties under oath. They are not ordinarily well enough acquainted with the principles of law or equity 
to administer either effectually in complicated cases. And hence, it has often been said that the judgment of arbitrators is but, but rusticum judicium, rough justice. And the consequence that he drew from that was that agreements to arbitrate were not enforceable. They were valid, but they were not specifically enforceable, rendering them effectively useless in the United States for some 80 years. This position was not an outlier. This was not unusual. The English courts adopted similar views, only being rescued by statutory instruments. In France, a classic decision also, ironically, in the 1840s. The Americans and the French don't usually do anything similarly. In this case, the French Court of Cassation took precisely the same view in a decision called Prunier versus Alliance, in which the Court of Cassation declared agreements to arbitrate future disputes invalid and unenforceable on the basis that Persons that were appointed as arbitrators might not, quote, be able to deal with the matter and worth the confidence the parties would entrust to them. Again, the basic notion that arbitration provides rough justice, not real justice, and thereby compromises both the rule of law and individual rights of citizens. This is a serious critique, one that the arbitral community must answer. And the answer to it I would suggest, and, and that's the principal focus of my, my comments this evening, the answer to it is that that has it exactly backwards. It's exactly wrong. The right to arbitrate is a fundamental right of citizens and is as important to the rule of law as other rights of citizens. Just as citizens have the right to marry whom they choose, the right to contract as they wish, the right to associate, as they will. So citizens have the right to settle their disputes with their contracting parties, with their spouses, with those in their associations, as they will. At the end of the day, disputes, the way to fix disputes, to mend relationships, is a fundamental aspect of individual rights, individual autonomy, and preservation of those rights is fundamental to the rule of law. And that is something that I think appeals not just to our common sense, our common sense of justice, but it's also something also that one sees just as one finds recurrent judicial hostility to arbitration through the ages, one also finds recognition of this thing, this right to arbitrate, as I have called it. And what I'd like to do in the time remaining is to refer to some examples historically, in diverse cultures of this right to arbitrate, which is, I would suggest, so important to the fabric of our legal culture today, both here in India and elsewhere. I'd like to begin with going back to France, where, as I mentioned previously, the Court of Cassation held arbitration agreements invalid on the basis that they compromised the rights of citizens. That, in fact, in the 1840s, was a dramatic about-face from the 1792 Constitution of Year One 